Uh, this is going to be an open-ended, ask questions about Office 365 that you have and maybe haven't gotten answered before. Um, Jacob, one of our engineers, um, what's your special title now? Systems engineer. Um, he's here to answer more technical questions. I can answer additional questions from a sales engineer standpoint. My name is Nick LaFleur. Um, so we're going to open this up to the floor and just kind of go through people as much as we can. If for some reason we can't get through all the questions, um, just right down there, there's a CCB and Microsoft booth. Both of us will be over there. We'll have access to an Office 365 portal. We can show things, we can demonstrate things, and we can also answer questions there for the rest of the day. So really your time. So ask away, whatever, whatever you want. Whoever puts their hand up first gets the first question. Go for it. So everybody's good here. We have a, uh, we're a multinational company. Our uh, parent company in Denmark controls the domain name that we eventually need to ship oh, into. Uh, we're looking at moving at this probably towards the end of the year for our next year. Uh, my questions would revolve around how many servers should we actually have uh, so there's redundancy and, and so that kind of thing. Because we just went through a weekend ago uh, rebuilding our on site exchange server. And it took nine hours with Microsoft on the phone to help me get it put back together. Um, so how do we how do we cover that kind of disaster? And, and how do you move when you've got multiple domain names and such if you want to consolidate them? Sure. So the question, uh, if you couldn't quite hear him, was around uh, redundancy and um, how many servers do they need to stay redundant and things like that. So the, the great answer there is if you move entirely to Office 365, the answer is zero. Uh, all of that is in the cloud and in 365. Uh, that is the, the sort of you've arrived point when you've migrated and gotten to that point. Uh, that's now from an exchange infrastructure standpoint. So eventually the idea is decommission your exchange servers to get everything into the cloud. Uh, that get, answer expands a little bit when you start talking about Active Directory integration. And if you're still doing that, those servers still exist on premise. So you still will have infrastructure present uh, for those type of things, but as far as the exchange infrastructure, the goal is to get rid of that. That's the whole point of moving into 365. As far as what the migration looks like and how many servers you need, uh, that really depends on how much data you're moving and kind of how many users are there. So based on what you said and different things, uh, a hybrid type migration is going to be the direction you'd be heading. Uh, which is going to be a longer term migration where you're kind of bringing people over in batches and in stages and you maybe move a group of people, make sure that everything's okay, everything works the way that you expect, then go ahead and move another group of people. And you slowly process through that whole migration uh, phase. Uh, and it looks a little bit different depending on what's there. Um, without going too deep in there, so we can kind of else I'd love to talk to you about that because there's lots of different options you can go as far as where you head for what infrastructure you need in place. When you do a hybrid migration, there is a server component that you put in place. It's the hybrid server, uh, and that handles uh, some mail routing, and, and the migration actually kind of flows through that infrastructure to get into 365. So I'd love to talk to you more about that as kind of part of what the ins and outs are of that. Uh, yeah, you do need, if you put a server in for AD Connect, which is that integration piece, there's a virtual server piece that sits for that too. So there is some infrastructure there, but a lot of that you can use, if, uh, especially if you're virtualized, you already have hardware in place that you can run those components on. Those virtual machines are pretty small. So you're talking about a domain controller and an AD Connect server, which takes, you can run uh, successfully with four gigs of RAM. So it's, it's pretty small uh, what's left on premise for it. Does that help? Okay, um, my company, we, we have a really old SharePoint running on 2003 server, and I need to get rid of it. And I wanted to know, can I put that on Office 365? Um, do you have like a SharePoint component that I could use with that? Absolutely. So uh, SharePoint Online uh, comes with Office 365, and uh, I believe you can migrate, I think, straight from 2003 into uh, into SharePoint Online. So when, when you say migrate, I can actually take our current SharePoint server and put it in there and have everything set up? Uh, yeah, the, the, the data structure uh, the data structure will come over, so all of your hierarchy, all of your folders and everything will come over with that. Uh, if you set up the uh, AD integration on the back end, you can actually even bring the security groups and all of the access control lists over That'd with it. Nice. I have no idea how you do that. Come talk to us. Um, and, and then I, I have one other question. Um, we're looking to move our 
email to Microsoft. We're using uh, Gmail right now. Mm -hmm. um, and is that hard to do? We actually have a different domain name than our email name. I don't know if that causes an issue. And I'm just wondering, is that something I can do? Like, if I don't do it right away, can I do it later? Because right now I'm more concerned about the, share, the SharePoint. Uh, uh. You can do it in either place. So the question was, uh, he has a different domain name for his current email design and infrastructure than where he's moving to. And so uh, he asked, does he need to do that domain purchase right away? Uh, you can do it on either end. Well, so we have if, the domain name. We're using uh, Google right now. OK. But it's different than our domain name. Our email name is different than our domain name. Gotcha. Know that's not our domain name. Um, shouldn't be a problem. Nope. You can, you can migrate those in yes. pretty seamlessly. The, uh, the nice thing that you get when you talk about 365, uh, we refer to it as like your tenant ID. So when you set up your account and you create a tenant or a subscription with Microsoft, you get uh, you put in like a business name and it is the name.onmicrosoft.com. And so that's what we refer to as like your tenant ID. And mail will always flow in and out of that address, uh, regardless of what they call the vanity domain or whatever your email domain is. So you can set all that up and get it configured and then just drop that vanity domain on top of there and it links it all together. So you can do that at any point within the migration. Uh, we usually do it up front so that you can make sure all your user accounts have the right uh, email addresses on them and all the appropriate aliases, but you can do that at any time. Well, then that goes into two transferring uh, current emails from Gmail. Some people have many gigabytes of mail. And you can migrate the all the data from Gmail. Yep, it'll come system. over. Okay. I assume that's something that's probably been done multiple times. Oh yeah, we've done yeah. tons and tons and tons of okay. migrations. Um, you probably also want to consider some kind of forward from the Gmail accounts. If that's the yeah, if they just have you know at Gmail, uh, you can forward things in that way too. It's, it's actually not. It's, our it's own a own custom one. custom one. Yeah. Oh okay. Yep. Yeah, you would just have the domain. There's one up here. So in the past, we've had on most networks. Again, you've got like an HTTP request that goes to the phone drive. So each user has their own space. So now as we get into using OneDrive for business, um, before if you had your H drive and then you don't work with the company anymore, I come in, I can see your H drive and deal with the manager and stuff on your files that you have. Now I've got a little bit different challenge where now if you're using OneDrive for business and you got all your files out there, as an admin, can I see those or how do I administer those? Yeah, there's, um, there's a couple different options. So I'm a huge fan of PowerShell. So a lot of the advanced in administration that you can do, uh, you can do with PowerShell. Uh, there's some things that aren't exposed in the GUI that there are capabilities out there. Some of those are in relation to the access control list and the permissions on OneDrive. And so you can assign essentially administrative permissions over that person's OneDrive. So essentially it's the same thing if you think of uh, a folder structure, and if you set it up so that Active Directory pushes out an H drive for everybody, even as an administrator, unless you take ownership of that, you can't see those files anyway. So it's a similar type process of if the person leaves the organization and you need to then go in and take ownership of those files, you can do that with OneDrive and essentially reassociate that OneDrive with an administrative account so you can go in and see the data that's in there. Um, PowerShell is the, the best way to do that. Um, I don't know of anything in the GUI uh, off the top of my head, but there, there are tools to do that. Um, there's a lot of really good documentation out there with PowerShell um, that the, community, the 365 kind of community puts together. So if I'm not a big PowerShell guy, I said, if the employee's no longer here, I change the password, go in and down, either look at the stuff or give the admin my account rates. Yep, you could. Yep, that would be the other option. So change change the password on there because you have full control over that user account, and then you could assign out permissions that way and, and give it to the administrator that way. You could do it that way, provided that you're signing in as the as the user that has left. Talk a little bit about the Office 365 licensing model, and does that give us? Pleasure. Does that give us a OneDrive like per subscription amount, or does that go into a big bucket for the whole company? And then can we map directly, drive letter mapping directly to that, that OneDrive store? Sure. So the question was uh, in relation to OneDrive, if the storage space is uh, like an organizational storage space that everybody pulls from, or if it's an independent storage space per user, 
So that particular piece, each user has their own one terabyte of storage space if they have access to OneDrive as part of their subscription. Um, as for mapping it to a letter, um, are you talking about you want to have some kind of a shortcut on your workstation? Right, so when, they're in, right, when they're in the office, for example, can we, just like we do with local storage, can we map a drive, a drive letter, to their OneDrive account so it looks more seamless to the user uh, when they're storing it? <laughs> um, sort of. So the, the way that OneDrive works, um, there's called the OneDrive Sync uh, agent. Uh, they they kind of change the actual naming of it every once in a while, but basically there's a client piece that you put on uh, each person's workstation that allows uh, the files to synchronize with OneDrive for business and with SharePoint. And so basically you browse, you install that piece, you browse to the web version of OneDrive or the SharePoint library or the SharePoint folder that you want to synchronize, there's a little button that says sync. You hit that and then you choose a folder of where to put that and then it will synchronize the data and uh, very similar if anybody's experienced, a lot of people know what Dropbox is and they have the little icons next to the file, a little red X saying that that folder or file is not synchronized, a little green check mark saying it is synchronized. Uh, you get that type of functionality then and you're using regular Windows File Explorer to browse. Uh, through those files. So it's not necessarily a drive letter, but you can then create a shortcut that would do that. Uh, the default installation when you set it up will actually, uh, Windows Vista, Windows 7 and above, will the favorites section when you open the file explorer and there's the favorites on the left, the default installation when you put in that synchronization agent will drop in a folder that says OneDrive for business and then usually your company name and then whatever SharePoint stuff you have there so it's easily accessible there and then you can just create a shortcut to different things. Uh, stuff we've done for people to standardize is we've pushed out that that is in the user's directory folder so you know see user's username and then uh, a folder for OneDrive or a folder for SharePoint and then we've pushed out with group policy to place a shortcut on their desktop or something that will take everyone to that same folder so if they need to access that it's not not a map to drive letter but you're able to then go ahead and uh, access those files from that location. You do lose, per se, some of the stuff of where you have a drive letter and the system is going to think that that's local and you can reference things from that drive letter. Some of that functionality looks a little bit different from so maybe where that would impact like a scripting process, uh, but you can get it pretty close to it where people are used to just browsing in like a file, file window. I would, I would also mention, keep in mind once stuff is in OneDrive or SharePoint, if they open that document, uh, and you can choose at that point to either edit it through the online version through the web browser, or have it actually stream out to the local applications that are installed on the workstation, assuming that they exist there. If they make edits and they hit the save button in the local application, it'll just save it back up to OneDrive and SharePoint. So it, it, it's, it's pretty seamless once it's all in there. I think there's that initial shift in the way that it slightly looks different, but once that's done, I think you're going to find that it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty easy, and it's going to make your life a lot easier from a management standpoint. Do you know what the default time for that is? Uh, Every time it changes, yeah. <laughs> okay, so doesn't this really five minutes back? No, I think there's a, I, the question was if there's a default sync time. Uh, most of it is every time that, uh, it's at file level when there's a change. Uh, even within the metadata, so if you were to go in in a Word document and change the metadata for the author, things like that, it'll detect that change and send it up. Uh, it'll also queue those changes so that, say, for instance, one of the things that we see a lot for SharePoint is a user will synchronize a library and they're off-site somewhere with no internet connection. They have all those documents. Maybe it's a form that they're filling out for someone. They fill in that form. As soon as they get back in the office or somewhere else with an internet connection, that'll recognize it right away and go ahead and push that up. I think somewhere in the settings there's like a there's a forced synchronization or basically it scans. They don't know what the default timing is on that, but most of the time it's instantaneous as soon as you make a change, it'll push it up right away. And keep in mind you're talking about like Word documents, so you're talking about a kilobyte, maybe a couple of kilobytes, something like that. So it's not a ton of data that's being pushed back and forth. I saw a hand pop up. So two different users edit the same thing at the same time. How does it handle that? So if two different users make changes at the same time, uh, whoever saves it, there's actually a component that pops up and lets them know other changes have been made that conflicted with this. And then you can actually see those changes and choose to overwrite them or disregard the changes that you've actually made. So there, you want to add that? Uh, it, it uses the version and control. So if you've ever done anything with version and control, um, and it'll show the different changes, it'll highlight it. It's the same thing as the revision control inside of Word and Excel the way that they are now. It'll highlight the changes. It'll do the same thing. Usually, 
it'll take, if, if people are working on it simultaneously, it will save the one whoever saved it first, and then whoever saves it second, it'll say conflicted copy. And then if you open those documents, it'll show you the, the versioning between them, and you can change that. You can avoid things like that, usually within SharePoint, and you can implement the document checkout, check-in, check-out process to get away from some of that if you want to control, I only want one person change, you know, editing this document at a time, uh, someone else, so you're editing the document and I go to grab it, it'll tell me it's read-only because someone else is working on it. You can set up things like that as well to avoid that situation, uh, but otherwise it handles it pretty much like it does when you're doing change control and if you've ever worked on a, a Word document with multiple people and they do the change tracking, it looks like that. Yes. What's the minimum bandwidth for each, for, for 365 per user? <laughs> So there's not really a hard, fast rule for the amount of bandwidth you want to have. What I usually tell people is it's going to be based on um, what features you want to end up using inside of Office 365. I mean, if you're going to use Exchange Online and maybe OneDrive, you're going to find you're going to need significantly different bandwidth than if your entire organization suddenly starts video conferencing all day long, as well as putting videos inside of OneDrive or something like that. Um, so I would say if you're going to run all the components, I usually suggest maybe looking at a couple hundred kilobits per second to be available um, per employee. Sorry. So, um, Lee, uh, one of our, our clients that we work with, so they have uh, eight eight bit or uh, eight megabit connection, eight by what? It's like eight by five. Eight by five. So a pretty lower end uh, cable connection and 20, just under 30 users. Yeah, just under 30 users. And they use Skype, they use uh, uh, OneDrive, they do other video conferencing, not through Office 365, but there's other data there that's being uploaded, and I don't think we've ever had a problem with anything. So it's it's not it's not huge. It depends on what you're doing there. Um, a lot of that will depend also, like Nick said, the data you're using. So if you're doing Word documents, Excel files, things like that, those are all pretty small. If you start synchronizing large, picture libraries and things like that. Obviously, you're going to have a lot more data there. Yeah. Or, or cat videos, yes. Um, so it depends on kind of what you have in there for data. Uh, you can usually do a pretty good job of estimating that by taking whatever your perimeter is and kind of seeing what's going through it. You can usually get pretty close to determine if you're OK, if you need more, um, if for some reason you ever feel you'd want to cut down. Um, you can usually estimate that pretty well, but it, it varies depending on what you're kind of all using in three, inside of 365. Another thing you could do as well is you don't have to turn on every feature inside of Office 365 from the start. You can actually go in and turn off other features and then slowly deploy those features to users so that you can you know, kind of ramp yourself up to the point of the full bandwidth that you're going to be utilizing. I've seen a lot of larger organizations just start with Exchange Online and then decide, I'm going to turn off SharePoint, I'm going to turn off Skype for Business, and then after they're ready, maybe start with a department. Turn on 10 users, monitor the bandwidth. Then turn on an additional 20 or 30 users and continue to go that route. So you have flexibility to um, kind of baby step your way into the full solution so that you're not crippling your organization with bandwidth in the event that everybody starts pushing all their data back and forth, everybody's video conferencing with each other all day long, and they're sending massive attachments back and forth between email. So you do have some, some flexibility there. Oh, he had one more question, sir. Does it require you then to change the QoS? I mean, if, if I'm running VoIP, does it require <laughs> that I'm going to have to automatically put data then ahead of teleconference? Uh, no, I, I would. I would. Pre so if you didn't hear, he asked about QoS and changing that. Uh, you'd always want to keep your VoIP at the top, uh, and then that other stuff with data underneath usually runs fine. Um, there's, there's, uh, you'd still keep, you'd still keep your VoIP at the top to make sure that you have that consistency because that's gonna, if there's a, if there's a packet drop or packet loss when there's an upload of that file, uh, it's just gonna try again. If the UDP packets drop out for your voice stream, then your call drops out or you have loss of stuff in between there. So it's, it's a, it's that TCP versus UDP connection, um, uh, that way. One yeah, I, well, mine was kind of similar to is I was wondering about bandwidth throttling and how much control can you control it so it doesn't. There, there's uh, so when we talk process. about so when we talk about different things, uh, there, there's multiple places inside of there where you have bandwidth, right? So one of those is if we're talking about the different components of 365 being Exchange Online. 
that's going to be email traffic. So that's all pretty small until you get into like attachments and things like that. So people normally aren't doing any kind of QoS on that type of stuff. When you start getting over into Skype for Business, and now you're talking video conferencing, you're talking um, you know audio that's coming across there from a VoIP perspective and things like that, those generally fall under QoS rules that people have in place if you're running QoS already. The, the data streams themselves, um, it, it's file transfer. So if we're talking about, you know, we covered email, you're talking about OneDrive and SharePoint, it's, it's file level. So again, those are small. There's not much you're gonna do from a QoS perspective usually inside of there. I'm not going to restrict yeah, file stuff. Thing, it, it would get... I, I, I was kind of like OneDrive or like I have my development department that makes videos and they could even be a gigabyte. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, like can I throttle that because if I can't, then they can't do it because that would just kill the whole company. Yep, so um, scenarios like that where we see different departments doing different things, the OneDrive sync agent itself doesn't have much in the way of telling it only use X amount of bandwidth or things like that, throttling at that level. We'll usually see people set up, like development will have their own VLAN, and throttling happens at that point uh, in the network infrastructure level instead of within like the sync agent yeah. itself. Okay. I was going to say, when you transitioned off to 365, do you know how many servers Microsoft servers or data is replicated to? Did you decide which data centers or can you kind of cover over the replication? Bits, bits and pieces, so um, they don't tell you exactly where it is. Um, the two things you, that they do tell you is that it's geo-redundant, so there's multiple data centers, so it's always gonna be replicated with inside the same data center to cover server failure. It's also then gonna be replicated geo-redundantly to cover a data center failure. They don't normally tell you exactly where it is as far as that, but they do tend to, based on when you sign up, you get put in a certain region so it's not like if you're on the East Coast, your stuff's going to be on the West Coast. They'll try to locate it as close as possible that way. So they do that based on your address and stuff when you put in your information and create your tenant. So as I say, have you also seen how it has worked for organizations that are across you know, the nation that have multiple offices? The difference, like, I don't know if you've worked with any clients that have done that. Just so you don't, you know, if you pick your home office, let's say, in Minneapolis, have someone that's also in California the fact of pulling that across. Yeah, so a lot of that too gets replicated based on the data centers and then essentially ends up in a, a CDN, so a content distribution network. So we've not seen any, like we work with people all over the place that have that, some people that have all home offices and they don't have a central location. And so when Microsoft pulls that from the underlying uh, you know, data center level up into the CDN, then you get the benefit of kind of wherever you are, you're, you're pulling it from somewhere that's local to you versus pulling it from across the country or Europe on the other side of the world, things like that. Are there additional charges for handling multiple domains for like one company? Not, uh, so the question was, is there uh, additional charges for handling multiple domains? Not from the 365 side only from whoever your registrar is. So if you purchase 10 domain names, you just have to set up the appropriate stuff, uh, usually a text record to show domain verification that you own it, and then it'll pull into your tenant, and you can assign addresses to any one of those domains uh, to your users. 365 doesn't have any cap on that. Twenty, yeah, 22 is the record we've had for someone that's migrated in there. They have 22 different domain names. Is it possible without a local AD to have a single sign-on experience with Office 365? Define single sign-on. Yeah, so, so you don't have to sign in. To, that's one of the things that's a little frustrating. With yeah, so, so the question was without local AD, can you get a single sign-on type experience? <coughs> kind of. Um, you could have credentials that were the same, uh, but without anything to reference to, without, you know, without an authoritative source there, you're not going to have a true single sign-on experience. Um, there's nothing preventing users from having their credentials the same that way, and so it's, it's still a single set of credentials, uh, but without some authoritative source to point back to, you'd never get like a true 
single sign-on type experience. So the Azure AD doesn't, doesn't give you that capability? Um, partially. Um, so, so if I'm understanding right, so you're saying, so if you do Azure Active Directory, and that's where your 365 is authenticating to, are you then authenticating all of your uh, end user devices into there? That would theoretically work. They'd all have the same set. Whether whether or not that would be a true single sign-on and they're not prompted for credentials, I'm not sure. But the credential source would all be the same in that case. Do you need ADFS? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Do, you, do you have ADFS federation set up right now? Or no. Okay. So are you hoping to have all servers out of your environment or yeah. keep some internal? No, I, you, I'd rather not have any. OK, because if you're going. If you're going down the ADFS route, because what he's trying to do is get a single sign-on experience by not having any servers inside of his environment, you could do that, but now you're talking about not only having that Azure Active Directory server, you now have to set up an Azure um, Active Directory Connect server, then you also need a ADFS server, an ADFS proxy server, and then you probably want to have some redundancy there, because once you go the single sign-on route, essentially what happens is somebody tries to log in through the web portal, it's going to redirect them, back to those servers for the authentication, and then it's going to throw them back into Office 365. If those servers are not available, you can't connect to Office 365. So there's a little bit of a single point of failure that gets added there. So typically an organization will add redundancy into there, where maybe you have like a, another set of servers set up at a different location. Now you're talking, um, you got your Active Directory, you've got your AD Connect, you've got your Federation, you got your proxy, then you got to duplicate the proxy and the Federation. Um, and an AD server to another site to have that additional thing. So now you're talking a pretty significant chunk of change to try to you get could, that experience. You could run that all in Azure if you wanted. And when they're talking redundancy, you can tell it what what region you want to put the virtual machine in. Um, so you could do it that way and get them spread out that way. It it would it's doable. It's pretty complex, but it's possible. Most of most organizations go the Azure Active Directory Connect route. It allows you to have your credentials identical between both environments, but doesn't have all the extra stuff that you need to have set up with it. And if the AD Connect server is down, people can still connect to Office 365. So I would say 95% of organizations that want Active Directory integration go that route versus the full single sign-on experience, which is the Federation route, which is just crazy complex. So uh, I just got here, so I apologize if somebody already asked this, but I've been uh, testing two-factor authentication for Office 365 with a small test group. And I, before I roll it out to the whole company, I found that the experience is actually really confusing between the app password and, like, we, like you'll, you'll bring up a authentication pop-up, and it'll ask you for your password. And it seems like it's completely random as to whether it's asking for your actual password or if it's asking for that app password that you generate. And I was wondering if, am I doing something wrong? Is this a work in progress? What's going on? Yeah, are you, are you using the, the built-in uh, two-factor authentication? Like inside the basic, of the... Uh, basic Azure Office 365 built-in, yeah. Yeah, um, so normally speaking, it, it's uh, normally they, they prompt you for credentials and it'll pop up, uh, pop up then and ask you for a code they usually look completely different. One is a, a Microsoft login page. If, you're, if you've experienced 365 before, it's the login page with like the highway on the left and you log in there. That's the first one. The second one usually takes you to a pretty blank screen that has a section that says uh, enter your security code. So they, they, they usually look completely different. So um, I can definitely, I'd love to take a look at it with you and see kind of what's there. Um, my problem is like things like Skype for Business will pop up. He needs credentials, and it'll pop it up, and it won't have any indication whether it wants your password or your app password. Sure. Yeah, yeah that, I, I would say that's not the norm. Okay. Uh, I'd love to take I, a look I would at it with you. Hear that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, stop by the booth because we have a demo stuff uh, set up over there. We can look at the tenant and some of that too. I'd love to take a look at it with you. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, back to the single sign-on thing. We use AD Connect. Because, um, like you said, we were looking at the, uh, the whole proxy server and all that. It was just a lot of work. And um, but as far as SharePoint, we need to have SharePoint online as well. Um, the only way to have like the single sign-on basically is to put your credentials in, check that box that says you know save my information, and that's about it. Right? There's no way you can just go to SharePoint. It'll grab your credentials and 
and just log them in right away. If you're talking from SharePoint online right. to log in that way, then the two options for you are it will uh, either A, prompt you, and if you have AD Connect in place, you're still prompted for credentials, but the credentials are the same. Right. Uh, the only option to get it where it just logs you in and doesn't prompt you for anything is to set up ADFS. And, and that will provide where you just you log in, and as long as you're authenticated to your computer, that way, uh, to Active Directory, it'll go ahead and sign you straight in. Skip that login screen. Right? Correct. That's how ours are. So uh, mine, when I go to 365, I still go to either portal.office365.com or login. Uh, either one of those URLs will get you there. Uh, as soon as I put in my email address and hit tab to go to the password field, it starts with a little progress thing and it's thinking. It realizes that our domain, CCB Technology, is set up with ADFS. It directs you to our ADFS portal. If I'm authenticated to my machine, my machine already, I don't see anything, and I get logged in. So really, it's not even that much of a shortcut, you know. I mean, because if you just leave that box checked and you're not deleting history, you're probably yep. So so you can you can do that. Uh, a lot of times too, we find that um, some people, for uh, different reasons, compliance stuff, things like that, can't have that option. So you can you can tell it not to do that and force it not to remember. But the credentials are the same, and so a lot of people, oh, I got to just put my password in one more time. And it's not too bad. Uh, and when you get into like biometrics, you can use your same biometric, you know, fingerprint scanner to log into your machine, and then also then log into the website. And so people say, well, the amount of work I need for ADFS to do that isn't so bad. So there's one more password prompt, and people will either use one of those two options, either re-authenticate or just tell it to remember, and they'll log in. Is what we see most people do. Uh, there's one up here. Yeah, two quick questions. Um, number one. Uh, so the question is, uh, if someone, where do you direct people for login? So either of the two, portal.office or login.microsoftonline.com, either of those two, or the most common thing that we'll do for people to set it up is create a CNAME record um, inside of your DNS provider. So uh, if you're domain.com, go ahead and set up one that says 0365.domain.com or login.domain.com. Or a lot of times, too, if you've moved to Office 365, chances are your address that you were using, so you came from an on-premise infrastructure and you had mail.domain.com, which directed people to OWA, just simply change that record of mail or webmail.domain.com as a C name to point to one of those two, and that tends to be a lot easier for people to remember, and then they can, they're can they referencing your regular domain, and it will redirect them to the appropriate URL. Okay. For the record, I favor login.microsoft.com. Okay. My other question was, with, as we use Skype for business, um, and we're a financial company, sometimes people will use the domestic piece instead of patient back and forth. Um, being a financial company, you know, they need to walk that, or they need to keep that for a lot of purposes. Is there anything, we have an E1 license, is there a way, how long is it keeping those? We don't have retention services or anything, but does it keep those? It will keep them in the conversation. Oh, sorry. Question was um, using Skype for business. They're doing chatting back and forth. There's compliances in play here. How do they ensure that that information is being kept in case they get audited? So conversation history is kept pretty much as, as long as you want it to sit inside of there. The only risk you run running on the E1 plan though is there's nothing in place forcing that information to be kept. So an employee could in theory go and delete that email, and if you didn't catch that being deleted, it, it's gone. So. I mean, you could set up um, probably do Azure Rights Management, something like that. Um, then you could add in some kind of a um, in-place hold or something along those lines to the archive, and maybe have it so it's, it's storing that information. If you did that, you could set up that archive to retain that information indefinitely. But that E1 plan you have doesn't have that archive built into it. You would either um, add that on as an a la carte option, which I'd have to look up at the prices. I can't remember offhand. Or, I mean, you could always go with a third party solution as well, but I think you're going to find it's quite a bit more expensive to go that way. So, to be clear, if me and you were going back and forth over a few days, my email, I would have that conversation tool that will have that data in it, mm -hmm. but I can go in and figure that out. Right. And then next week, if someone says what happened, there's nowhere else you're going to see it. If, if, well, it goes to an administrator's 
Yeah. Like if somebody deletes something and goes to an administrator's recycle bin, so that would be uh, So if, if you did that exact case, so you have no uh, legal hold or archiving or anything in place, uh, retention policies, it would store in your conversation history. As soon as you then delete that, it, it's gone. Well, it, it's in the recycle bin for a period of 30 days, and then it goes away. It's not data that's considered to be kept. If you set retention policies within the mailbox or within that folder, even if you delete them, they're being held in the e-discovery folder that way. So depending on how you have your retention policies and stuff set up and all of your holds and everything like that, even if as the user you delete it from the conversation history, it's still archived with inside of your tenant accessible to the administrator. So there, there's some policies to set up there to make it so that um, if a user deletes things, they're still present for you uh, from an administrative side. So, the question was, if you have Active Directory integration, you added a new user, will it automatically apply a license to the user subscription? Um, it will not. What you'll have to do is actually put that license on that user. Um, it will automatically create the user for you, so you don't have to go and put the credentials in, or I'm sorry, not the credentials, but the information in for that particular user. You will need to then purchase a license either, um, depending on how you have your subscription set up, because you can set up a subscription directly through the Office 365 tenant or portal, or you can actually buy them like their volume licenses through like uh, CCB, for example. And then you would get a license key that you would apply to your subscription, and then you would have either a monthly or a yearly uh, subscription added to that account. So it depends on how you have it set up, um, but you, you, you can go ahead and do that minus the license application to the user. Although you can do that with Photoshop. Uh, if, you're, if you're out of licenses, uh, you create the user on premise, the synchronization happens, that user account will show up inside of your tenant and they just don't have a license assigned to them. Um, anytime you go in to work with a user account, if you select it, it'll tell you X number of X number, so one of 10 assigned. And so if there's nothing left, there's no licenses, the user account is over there. And if you try to assign a license, it'll tell you you're out of licenses. And there's usually a link right there that you can click that takes you still right within your portal and your tenant, and you can go buy more licenses. So uh, all of that's handled directly. You can do the whole thing right inside of your tenant. You can do all of the a la carte options inside of your tenant. So if, say you're doing an E1 plan where office uh, downloadable Office applications are not included, but there are three users that you want that need Office, you can go select those three ones and assign those licenses individually to those users, and then they have that capability. So it's all handled inside of your tenant. And those users are transferable, correct? Yep. If, so, if somebody leaves, yep. So you can deactivate the one account and then reassign the license to someone else. Absolutely. Now you With um, the migrations to 365, have you had any clients using the mobile device management, like Microsoft Intune? We, we've had a little, bit of, a little bit of both. We've had some people, uh, the question was, have you had people use the MDM solution, the mobile device management side? Uh, yes, on both fronts. So Intune is a, a separate component of things usually from the 365 stuff. Uh, it's a separate sort of suite uh, of functionality uh, that you can still use simultaneously with 365. And then there is a MDM component inside of 365 that we've had people use to lock down. Uh, I don't want any Android devices less than version 4. Uh, I don't want any iOS devices less than whatever version. I'm not an Apple guy, sorry. Um, so you, you can lock down that. You can lock it down to say, uh, so for instance, one of the things that's talked about a lot, so say you're in a union type position and you're not supposed to work after hours type thing because uh, there's overtime pay. You can control inside of MDM to just say, I only get email pushed to me during business hours. After business hours, they can still technically access their email if you wanted to have that, but they're not going to get any new email coming in. So they can't say, oh, I had to, this email came in at 8.30 and I had to respond to it. There's not going to be any email the next morning, hit business hours, go that way. So we've had people do that. There's a lot of functionality inside of there that ties in with 365 that tends to be a little bit different than Intune. Uh, they're, they're kind of two separate forks of, of, you know, for what they're for, what their purposes are. Anything else?
else. You mentioned that admin recycled it a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Where do you go to access that? PowerShell. <laughs> uh, I, I don't use the GUI. I, I um, personally, there's lots of stuff that you can't do in the GUI that you can do in PowerShell. So I just use the one where I can do everything. Um, if you're not a PowerShell guy, there are some, some uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Plug for our partner. Uh, 360 Training is over there. They do a lot of really good training uh, about all sorts of stuff in 365. Stuff that's available in the admin council, so you can, at least you can understand what's there. Um, the 365 community as a whole of, of people that are out there and doing things with it have uh, great resources all across uh, the web of different things of PowerShell stuff that's out there. Um, Microsoft has an entire script library uh, of PowerShell. Uh, commands that you can go find that, that break down what it is. They're, in order to be posted there, they're really well documented as far as what happens, what they're doing, when they were written, what their purpose is, uh, things like that. So, um, learn PowerShell. <laughs> the, uh, the other side of it then is there are some components when you drill into, you'll see like your tenant administration, and then if you scroll all the way down, there's an admin section on the, the bottom left until they change the tenant, um, which is happening soon, anyway. The, there's an Exchange admin and a SharePoint admin, and you can use those to drill more into the advanced administrative functions. And there's usually, I think it's it e-compliance, I think is the name of the link. You can go in there, uh, compliance or e-compliance, um, you can go in there and see some of that compliance stuff for your holds, where things are. So there, there's some accessibility inside of there to access it from the GUI, uh, that you can, go, you can go find it and, and pull it up. I don't know where they are off the top of my head. Tell you what to run in PowerShell, but <laughs> anybody else? As far as the Azure Premium for like self-service password recovery and stuff, or uh, so so um, Azure Premium has a whole bunch of different components inside of it. So there's, there's the AD stuff, there's the self-service password reset, which links in with AD. There's a bunch of other stuff in there. So specifically, there's, there's stuff we talk about, but as a whole, it, that's a really broad one. There, there's stuff in there that's good and, and it fits really well for some organizations. There's some stuff where, honestly, the cost differential between hosting it in Azure in the cloud and doing it on-prem, there are options where it's still cheaper to actually put a little server on-premise uh, or utilize some of the functionality in whatever your perimeter security appliance is uh, to do some of those things. Um, it, it's not always best or better to go to Azure. Um, you know, so it, ha it has its place. There's parts of it that we use a lot and there's parts that, that I've never touched. When is the uh, OneDrive uh, sync agent going to be unified so there's not one for the personal and one for <laughs> uh, So the question was, is when is the OneDrive agent for the personal and the business going to be synchronized? Uh, I haven't heard anything about when it's going to. I don't know if they will. Um, they're, they're using two kind of different backends for the, the platforms there. Uh, and I think the idea was to keep them separate because there's been a lot of uh, frustration around knowing which account to use. So if anybody has ever experienced, you have your organizational account, which is like the little badge guy, right? And then there's the Microsoft account, which is the little Microsoft logo. They're two entirely different things. They are not associated with one another. As an administrator of an Office 365 tenant, I cannot control anything in that Microsoft account. However, it may have your business email address. So my Microsoft account is Jacob Tarowski at CCB Technology. My administrators have nothing to do with that. My organizational account is also Jacob Tarowski at CCB Technology. They're two entirely different things. So I don't see them coming together. I see them actually putting more of a division so it's clearer as to which account you're using. So I think they're probably going to keep those separate going forward because the backend authentication mechanisms are going to be entirely different once they sort out all of those accounts. That said, Microsoft is Microsoft. It might be worth asking the Microsoft rep to see if they've heard any rumblings internally of something that they're planning to do. Yeah. So following on to that, uh, is, is there any plan that you know of for like SharePoint syncing and OneDrive for Business syncing? It seems like they're interconnected in some way, but I don't know whether they're moving them closer together or keeping them apart. And we 
we've actually had some problems with, uh, we've had some pretty consistent problems with Thank synchronization you. break breaking. Join the club. Yeah, I, I've <laughs> seen much wailing and tearing of hair on the internet about, about this. Yeah, uh, so to, to briefly answer that one, um, they're, they're coming closer together. Um, in Q1 of this year, they launched uh, a new OneDrive for Business sync agent that was supposed to help unify that and help with a bunch of those issues. Um, so I, I think that side of the house would be closer together because you're accessing the same kind of back-end resources with it. Um, as far as the sync issues, uh, we've encountered those because we use it quite extensively for ours. Um, we have all sorts of stories and different things of what we've seen, what we've not seen, and obviously right up. We have real-time collaboration, it's just a great word for everybody. Yeah, there, there's been all sorts of stuff out there where the, the OneDrive for business component of it um, is, is definitely not what I would consider a full production thing. If you're using it inside of the online portion, absolutely it runs great and the collaboration is awesome. This piece that they're getting to try to extend that to an end user on their desktop or their mobile device is still, I would definitely call it in the works. So and I, I saw a little bit of a online chatter about the 2016 apps having a different back end yep. than the 2013 apps as regards this kind of like a master document, you know, doing things a little bit better. Do you, can you confirm that? Or? Uh, we've, we've seen, I can't necessarily confirm that, we've seen less issues with uh, things now that 2016 is rolled out and the new Wonder Effort Business Agent has rolled out. Uh, we've seen things get better. Uh, but we definitely, uh, any migrations that we do when we talk with people, those, those are always some of the things that we point out. And uh, I usually phrase it like, it's a great feature, it's not quite ready for prime time. It, it's kind of where I put it. And so we tend to lean towards letting people know, like, this is great, but please do what you did. Please test it. Please try it. Don't roll this out and expect it to be flawless and great. Uh, because then you're going to, the expectations are set for this and, and, it, and it fails. So there, there are definitely some things there. That's that's the pro and con that we found with 365 is that you're on the cutting edge, and that's great for certain things. You're also on the cutting edge. So if things are out there and they launch that, it, it may not land the way that they want it to or, or go in the direction that they want it to. So that's kind of been the, the give and take there that you do when you jump into something like 365.